All right, everybody, welcome to the June meeting of the Tell City Historical Society. We have 10 meetings a year, and every meeting uh, it starts with a program. Uh, the programs we try to make very interesting. Uh, last month's program was on the fire at Swiss Plywood, which went over very well. And of course, tonight's program is Operation Baby Lift. But before we get started, I want to say a special thanks to Betty Cash for allowing us to use um, this room. And she is always just a model of cooperation. And also to the Perry County News. Is there anybody here from the newspaper? But they gave us outstanding uh, coverage uh, for this event. And um, we have, some, we have some new leadership down there at the Perry County News, and they're really trying hard to make things work. The Historical Society and our mayor meetings are held at the museum, where we have a meeting room. It holds about 40 people, so you can see why we moved it down here. But I hope everybody's aware of, of our museum. It is an extremely informative museum. Mark Ress is the curator. And it's open on usually on Sunday afternoons, or you can always call Mark if you need any information on family or a business or anything in Tell City. It's, it's a fascinating place, and there's even been some talk about some people having reunions or business meetings up there. We're always well, we're always welcome to that. And if anybody's interested in joining the society, you may do so after the meeting. This program here is going to last uh, less than one hour. And uh, so I'm going to get started here. I want to introduce two people who want to run. First is Don Neal. Don is a uh, six-year, uh, he was a pilot of the United States Air Force for six years, and one year was a battle tour in Vietnam. Harriet uh, Goffnett Neal. Harriet has two sisters, Lucy Ubalor, right there, and Sarah Jane Dammit. So she has local roots. She grew up around uh, St. Mark's. Eric was a flight nurse with the United States Air Force and served 15 months in Vietnam. 15 months in Vietnam and ended with what we're about to see. So without further ado, I want to turn the program over to Harry and Don Neal. that crashed just outside of Saigon, Vietnam in April of 1975. This is the story of one day in the life of U.S. AeroVac operations. It captures the true spirit of all AeroVac members, past, present, and future, flying a humanitarian mission into a war zone. It's also the story of heroism and self-sacrifice by the crew members, flight and medical, as they cope with an ongoing airborne disaster that ultimately resulted in the crash. Lastly, it's the story of how seemingly very small decisions can and do affect our lives and those of our family, our crewmates, and our friends forever. You'll note several of those decision points during the story that I tell. By way of introduction, I grew up here in Perry County, attended St. Mark's grade school, and graduated from Perry Central High School in 1968. You may ask yourself why a county girl is speaking to the Tell City Historical Society. Well, actually, I started out here at the Old Parkview Hospital, one of the last babies born at the hospital hall. As the story goes, Dr. Joe and I met in the nursery, born just days apart. He's not here tonight, but he's the older one. Yeah. <laughs> in June of 1972, I graduated from the University of Evansville with a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. Throughout my university years during the Vietnam era, the campus anti-war demonstrations and the awful treatment of the veterans returning from Vietnam all across the country were really disturbing. The situation prompted me to seriously entertain putting on the uniform and joining the military in protest of those actions. 
Of the four services, the Air Force won out, and I volunteered during my senior year in college. After learning that I had never actually flown in an aircraft, my recruiter booked me a flight from Evansville to Louisville for my induction physical. Not exactly a long flight to an exotic place, and I'm sure we didn't get much above 10,000 feet. But as the flight, the first flight of my life, it was really exciting. And so began my love of flying and travel to this day. After passing the physical, I was commissioned a first lieutenant in October of 1972 and sent to Shepard Air Force Base in Texas in January of 1973 for officer's orientation. You can move to the next slide. Betty's coming in. <laughs> Technical glitch, sorry. <laughs> surgery and orthopedics ward of this large Air Force Regional Medical Center for a year. Most of the other nurses on my unit were young and single like me, so we worked hard, we partied hard, and we really supported each other, and we remain lifelong friends to this day 48 years later. Most Air Force personnel strive to become part of a flying organization, and I was certainly no different. My dream of becoming a flight nurse finally came true when I received orders to the 9th Aerovac Group at Clark Air Base in the Philippines. During a temporary duty stop at Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio, I attended the flight nurse course at the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine. This is where I first met and became friends with Captain Mary Klinker. She was a fellow Hoosier with a terrific sense of humor and a very down-to-earth attitude, which you all would recognize here. Mary had also received a flying assignment out of flight school. She was bound for the 10th Aerobac Squadron at Travis Air Force Base in California, just outside of San Francisco. She and I became good friends as we learned the principles of delivering medical care at altitude, went through survival and altitude chamber training together, and practice ditching exercises in case we were ever forced to land in water, etc. The concept of staying in your comfort zone during military training does not exist. <laughs> Following the completion of flight training in early February 1974, an exceptionally long series of flights from Indiana to the Philippines began. The first flight of the trip was from Indiana to California, where I spent a couple of days with Mary. At Travis, those of us headed to duty stations in the Pacific boarded a Flying Tigers military charter, took off for Anchorage, Alaska, went on to Tokyo, Japan, and our last leg was to Clark Air Base in the Philippines. This experience certainly embodied the travel that I had envisioned when I joined the Air Force. Upon arrival at Clark Air Base, I reported into the 9th Aerobac Group in early March of 1974 and met the colleagues with whom I'd be flying for the next 15 months. Please move to the next slide. <laughs> Before any Air Force Service member assumed active flying status over Southeast Asia, it was mandatory to attend and graduate from the U.S. Air Force Jungle Survival Course, affectionately called Snake School. <laughs> Generally, the only females who passed through the school were flight nurses, and I was the only female in my class. Growing up on a farm does not produce shrinking violence when it comes to bugs, noises, and snakes in the jungle. After two days of ground school, I thoroughly enjoyed being dropped off by a helicopter on Mount Pinatubo, where we spent two days and nights learning about and living in the jungle overgrowth on the side of that active volcano. 
all the while being pursued by local natives who were rewarded with a bag of rice for every one of us that they captured. <laughs> As an aside, some of you may remember that Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991 and it almost completely destroyed Clark Air Base and the surrounding uh, areas. But that's another story. Move to the next slide. I finally went on active flying status on March the 18th after completing the jungle training. It was both one of the proudest days of my life and the scariest. The realization of the responsibility of the position finally hit me at that point. I was all 23 years old at that time. And this is where the real story begins. It's a story into which you could probably insert any one of us that had been trained by the School of Aerospace Medicine with the same amazing results. I've spent considerable time reviewing my accident investigation statement that I gave to the Air Force right after the crash and also other sources of information to refresh my memory about the crash. You will hear a lot of I and I remember statements because this is a first person account. So please just bear with me. I'm also going to use my notes extensively to make sure that I capture all the details accurately. For a year, as a very young first lieutenant, I flew regularly scheduled missions on the C9A Nightingale aircraft to Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Okinawa, and then all through the Philippines. Often as medical crew director responsible for all of the patients and all of the medical care in the back of the aircraft. This aircraft is now retired from service, but at that time it was new, and it was and still is the only dedicated and specially designed aerobac aircraft in the world. Each scheduled mission with a medical crew of two nurses and three aerobac techs assumed the feeling of being just another day at the office. The next slide. In addition to our regularly scheduled missions, two C-9 aircraft, two medical crews consisting of one flight nurse and two aerobac techs, were on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The mission for these first and second alert crews involved launching on a C-9A aircraft within an hour of being notified by the control center to pick up any member of the active duty armed services or their dependents who was deemed in danger of losing life, limb, or sight. It was an awesome privilege and responsibility to be part of such an organization with that kind of a mission and dedication. By March of 1975, the situation in South Vietnam had deteriorated to the point that there was a lot of North Vietnamese activity in the Saigon area. The airport had been shelled several times and the South Vietnamese government was collapsing. We continued our regular C-9 missions into Thanh Sinh Air Base in Saigon to serve the Seventh-day Adventist Hospital, which at that time was used by the remaining active duty military in Vietnam. We were making steep approaches into and climb outs from the airport as a safety precaution against any potential enemy ground fire. It was pretty exciting to feel that aircraft, the nose go up in the air and just practically shoot for the sun on takeoff because that aircraft is just not designed to do something like that. Mary Klinker and I were standing a normal second alert when the Operation Baby Lift order came down from President Ford in the White House. We were alerted by our control center very early in the morning, arrived at the squadron around 6 a.m., and were told that our mission was to fly immediately to Saigon to pick up the first loads of Vietnamese orphans. The 9th Aerobac crew at Clark and the 10th Aerobac squadron out of Travis in California were in the process of combining at that point, so our crews were all mixed up as we were cross-training on each other's aircraft. This was the first opportunity that Mary and I had to fly together, and we were really excited about the possibility. Next slide. Okay. 
The first alert crew took off for Saigon on a C-5A, affectionately called Fat Albert for obvious reasons, an hour or so before we did. At that time, the C-5 was the largest transport aircraft in the world. Mary and I, with the rest of our second alert crew, took off on a C-141 cargo aircraft shortly thereafter. We landed safely at Tan Sanu in Saigon and quickly discovered that our 141 was only going to be carrying adult evacuees back to Clark and no babies as we had expected. Our medical crew made the decision to radio the control center at Clark requesting that our crew and all of our supplies be transferred to the C-5 to further assist that crew and use our expertise. Most of the C-5 loading had already taken place and departure was imminent by the time we boarded the aircraft. The first alert C-5 medical crew director nurse assigned duty positions to each of the five of us on the 141 crew as we hurriedly entered the aircraft. You go up, you stay down, you go up, and so on. Up meant the troop compartment at the top of the aircraft, just aft of the wing section, an area that is designed to carry military personnel in the 70 or so rearward facing airline type seats. Down meant to stay in the cargo compartment, normally reserved for carrying tanks, aircraft, helicopters, and other military cargo. You can see those areas on the slide here as it's illustrated. This random assignment sequence is one of those defining moments I mentioned earlier that determined the rest of one's life. You go up or you stay down. The three slides during this portion of the story are only to provide context. This is a story of the flight and medical crews, the American civilian evacuees who were primarily from the defense attache office in Saigon, and the orphans on the flight not the aircraft. The first slide shows a schematic of the C no, go back once we the first slide shows a schematic of the C5 and the location of the troop and the cargo compartments. I, another flight nurse, and three Aravac techs were assigned to that troop compartment and we never returned below during the flight. Captain Plinker was assigned to the cargo compartment along with the medical crew director nurse and the other three airbag techs. Little did I realize that I would never see three of these crewmates again. The C-5 medical crew director had assigned herself downstairs to direct traffic on the m -planing. She directed most of the babies, younger children, and some of the kids with braces and crutches to be taken to the troop compartment. The older children and a majority of American civilian personnel stayed in the cargo area. My first impression upon climbing into the troop compartment was of orderly but frenetic activity. It was really hot and sweat was pouring off of everyone. The babies were secured two to a seat with pillows between them and their tummies to, for safety. And there must have been well over 130 or 35 babies and, and children in the seats. Some of the babies were looking around curiously. Others were crying loudly, probably as much due to being restrained and the heat as fear. At least two flight crew loadmasters were assigned to the compartment, and they assisted the two flight nurses and the three airbag techs as much as they could while still doing their own duties. There were also at least five civilian American ladies in the troop compartment with us, and they were offering as much help as possible also. One of the ladies and I had a short conversation prior to takeoff, during which she told me that her adult daughter, who was in the troop compartment, was really frightened to fly. I made it a point to search out the daughter and try to reassure her, and also to thank her for what she was doing to help us with the babies and the children. To eliminate confusion and to ensure that none of the babies were neglected during the flight, we assigned each medical crew member and some of the American civilian ladies to the babies and the children in separate rows. My assigned area was the forwardmost section of the troop compartment just behind the wings with the two rows across from and one after the latrines. You can see that area circled in red up at the top in that green area just under the troop compartment label. 
This gave me responsibility for 18 to 20 babies in those rows containing about 10 seats. Many of the babies were still crying and scared, so we used pre-filled juice and water bottles to quiet them down, concentrating on those that were crying the loudest in an effort to try to calm down the rest of the ones around. The older children, at least two young Vietnamese boys with braces and crutches, and one American child, who I think was probably about 12, were put to work giving juice to the babies seated adjacent to them to keep them busy, and it also helped us out as well. We concentrated on getting to the babies who were crying the loudest, again, to create a calming effect on the rest. As soon as the aircraft doors were closed, the atmosphere cooled down and many of the babies fell asleep. One of the load masters gave us a pre-takeoff briefing. Most of the seats were occupied by the babies, so the members of the medical crew and most of the American ladies did not have seats, and we assumed race positions between the rows of seats for takeoff. After an uneventful departure, a little after 4 p.m. local time, we continued with the juice and the water for the babies who were still awake. At some point, the medical crew director nurse stationed in the cargo compartment climbed the ladder to the troop compartment to retrieve some medication for someone down below who was sick. She never had time to return below before the incident. Another one of those defining moments. Again, such small bits of timing make an absolute lifetime's worth of difference. Amidst all the continuing activity, there was a sudden loud pop and condensation filled the air. All the oxygen masks dropped and I remember seeing bits of a fuzz type material in everyone's hair. Some of the insulation panels on the inside of the troop compartment had come loose but nothing had come off completely. The air became a little cooler, but there was no other physical effect that I noticed in that troop compartment. The crew reacted calmly and automatically to this rapid decompression, as we had been taught in flight school. I immediately donned one of the oxygen masks and began to assess the situation. The young American boy and the small Vietnamese boy with braces were each in one of the latrines across from my section of seats. I helped them with their oxygen masks and then I began to give whiffs of oxygen to the babies that were under my care. We hadn't been airborne long so I knew that there wouldn't be a really long need for supplemental oxygen. Soon one of the load masters came through and told us that we were low enough at that point that we could take off our oxygen masks. When I asked him what had happened, he said the whole back end of the aircraft had blown off. At that point, I and the rest of the medical crew knew that we were in really serious trouble. As later reported, we were only 12 minutes out from Saigon over the South China Sea and passing through an altitude of 23,000 feet when this event occurred. One of the loadmasters told us we were turning back to Tonsonut Air Base in Saigon. So we began preparing for a possible crash landing, fastening seat belts, checking seat belts, stowing gear, etc. I remember at some point making a quick trip to the rear of the troop compartment through, and, and looking down through this metal grate that was the, the floor of the galley area, and I saw a huge hole in the bottom of the aircraft. Ambery green liquid covered some surfaces and I could see the sun shining on the water down below. I also saw people strapped in under blankets down in the cargo compartment. I later learned that one of the aerobac techs in the cargo compartment was seriously injured during the rapid decompression. There were two Air Force mission photographers aboard with us. They were documenting the first operation <coughs> baby lift military mission and they used their high intensity lights to illuminate the area so that the one remaining flight nurse downstairs could tend to the airbag tech. Back in the troop compartment, one of the load masters returned to my area and helped the young American boy brace himself against the latrine wall. Then he took the small Vietnamese boy in the other latrine on his lap to protect him as best he could. Their, all three of their seats were in rear of me, and at that point, it was too far for them to go to return to their seats. At the same time that we were dealing with the situation in the troop compartment, 
the pilot and co-pilot were battling a severely crippled aircraft. As was later revealed, the aft door locking mechanism failed. As it broke, the aft doors and a portion of the loading ramp blew off from the increased cabin pressure during our climb out to altitude. It severed the tail, flight control cables, and most of the hydraulic cables, causing the loss of most of the flight controls. All the flight crew had to work with were some right aileron control and engine power to control speed and bank. As you may have noted from the earlier pictures of the C-5, there are no windows in the troop compartment. So those of us up there had no visual idea of how far we were from, from the ground. We couldn't really tell what was going on at all. After a very few more minutes airborne, I can still hear someone yelling, brace, brace. I then braced myself by kneeling on the floor between two rows of seats, facing forward and holding tightly to the arms of the seat in front of me. The pilots managed to bring us nearly to the airport, but the additional drag of dropping the landing gear slowed us down to the point that we dropped enough that we impacted about two miles in a rice paddy short of the Saigon airport, and we skidded for about a quarter of a mile. At the time of initial impact, I remember thinking we had just made a hard landing back at the airbase. However, the aircraft became airborne again for another half a mile, crossed over the Saigon River, hit a dike, and then broke apart. At this point, the fuel caught fire and some of the wreckage was set ablaze. At that second impact, I saw flames and felt heat and cinders hit me in the face from the front of the troop compartment. After the flames and the heat of that second impact, I don't remember much other than the feeling of tumbling forward and mud splattering into my face. I landed upside down on my head against the forward wall of that troop compartment. There were pieces of what I think were the inside panels of the aircraft cabin on top of me and someone on top of those panels. I learned later that it was the medical crew director who had been thrown forward from her position rear of me in the troop compartment. I never lost consciousness, and soon one of the loadmasters un uncovered me and pointed to a new hole that had been ripped in the front of the troop compartment. Considering the last thing I remembered was flames and heat and cinders, my fight or flight mechanism inevitably took over and out that hole I went. From an area that I've learned is normally over 60 feet above the ground, I crawled out into the mud of the rice paddy. Next slide, please. 